Hello and welcome to this Practice Excellence webcast from the studios from Accounting Web Studios in Bristol. I'm Tom Herbert, editor of the site. Thank you very much for tuning in and thank you also to Free Agent for supporting this webcast. I'm delighted to say that this is what I think is the world's first live interactive VAT game show. Stick with us, it's not as crazy as it sounds. Um, so while politicians and government officials battle it out with Brexit and making tax digital, in the real world, VAT is one of the biggest minefields for small businesses and, well, businesses of any size and their advisors. Uh, there's a complex web of case law and precedents that can trip up even the most seasoned of accountants. But fortunately, help is at hand in terms of our panel. Uh, delighted to welcome his debut in the Accounting Web Studios. It's the uh, the Viscount of VAT himself, independent VAT expert Neil Warren. Hi, Neil. Hello, Tom. Hello. And uh, to my left, and the panel of tax experts is uh, Emily Coltman, who's Chief Accountant at Free Agent. Hi, Emily. Hello, Tom. And last but certainly not least, it's Rebecca Cave, Director of Tax Writer Limited and Accounting Web's very own consulting tax editor. Hi, Hi Rebecca. Tom. So. Um, Let's run through the agenda very quickly. There's a lot to get through. So we've got four cases to present to you. Got a business splitting case, um, company car case, a recording studio case, and a cricket club pavilion case. So quite a varied bunch in there. Um, if we have time at the end, then we will answer your questions also. A bit of event housekeeping before we start. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please don't worry. All the sessions will be available on demand on YouTube. So if you've registered, you will receive uh, a link to that. So if you're having any technical issues, please email info at practice-excellence.co.uk. Uh, in terms of questions, if you'd like to ask any questions to the panel, please use the chat window to the side of this video. It should be on the right-hand side. If you're watching in full screen, you'll need to minimize by clicking the box in the bottom right-hand corner. You'll also receive a written session summary with key takeaways from today and the slides. So don't worry, you will get the slides. So uh, how's it going to work? Uh, Neil is going to present the facts on a particular VAT dispute. You'll have 30 seconds to vote on whether you think the taxpayer or HMRC won the case. Now you can vote using the chat window to the right of this video. Um, more on that in a second. Neil will then reveal who won and the panel will discuss why this case is important for accountants. So as you can see on the slides, there's the chat window where you can ask your questions. And in this chat window is where you should be able to vote. So that should be up there with you now. Right, let's get started. Case one, business splitting, over to you, Neil. Thank you, Tom. Now, this particular topic is very important in VAT because potentially you can split a business and get two VAT registration thresholds if they trade under separate legal entities. And we're going to look at a case involving a hairdressing business and some key issues as to whether it was a single partnership or in fact two sole traders. So here are the key flag, facts on the screen, which I'll run through now with you. Uh, husband and wife, they traded from the same premises, which was their house. They had different uh, parts of the house and the husband focused on men's barber type um, cuts and the wife was more an upmarket hairdresser uh, solely for ladies. They completed a single partnership self-assessment tax return each year to declare their, their tax but claimed to be sole traders. And the reason they claimed to be sole traders because HMRC caught up with them, noted that the turnover on the partnership accounts was way over the threshold and had been for 10 years and HMRC went back with a late registration and £125,000 of tax and a late registration penalty. Key facts, there was one set of annual accounts produced by the external accountants, a single trading name, single telephone line, a single account with suppliers, a single insurance policy, and also a single music license for the music in the establishment. Um, against that, they had separate tills excuse me, for the uh, business to record the cash. They hired and fired staff independently. And a key point, each part of the business could be sold separately without the consent of the other. So the wife could sell her part of the salon as a going concern without talking to the husband. 
and vice versa for the husband's part of the business. So a combination of factors there. And how do you think the case went? Did HMRC win or did the taxpayer win? Good stuff. Well, we'll um, hopefully open the um Hopefully, open the poll the, the polling very soon. But uh, in the meantime, um, we've got a business splitting case that has no split ends. <laughs> um, oh, <Tom. laughs> Rebecca and Emily, how do you think it went? Well, I fail really to see how it could be a win for the taxpayer. If mm. they're filing a partnership tax return, then surely they're saying their business is a partnership, aren't they? So how could they argue they were two sole traders? Yeah, it's very difficult to see that, mm. isn't it? I mean, although Neil said that there were two different customer groups almost. That's true, yes. Male customers for the husband, female customers. But still, I mean, that that still doesn't make much sense that they could possibly say that there was two different businesses with one no. phone line, mm. one insurance, and basically one in one, one name yes. too. Yes, I mean, exactly. No, that, and they were the same premises, but different parts of the same premises. Mm. And doing the same thing for their different pools of customers. So if, for example, the wife had been hosting a nail bar in hers, yes. then that would have been two different kinds of business. But yes. they were both cutting hair. Yes. So uh, I can't really see how it could possibly be anything other than a victory for HMRC. Yeah, it's very difficult to yeah. see. I mean, I have seen sort of cleaning businesses where the customers are very different. You know, mm. the husband may do businesses for his cleaning operation and the wife may do desk domestic premises. Yes. And that's a more distinct split of customers. Mm. But on this one, you know, both the groups of customers were individuals, yes. members of the public. Exactly. And your point about business and domestic, I suppose what you've got there is if the husband is cleaning business premises, those businesses are likely to be registered for exactly. VAT. Whereas if the wife's cleaning domestic premises, they're not. So there would be an advantage there to business yes. splitting because you could avoid losing domestic customers by having to charge them extra to cover the yes. VAT. But in this case, both sides of the business would be battable sales. If, the, if you brought them together and said they were one. And as I say, I don't, don't really see how you could do anything other than yes. say they were one. I, th I, think, I think the uh, husband and wife in this case made a bit of an error uh, saying that they were a partnership to HMRC. Well, quite, because if they so say they were a they partnership to hole? HMRC, yes, exactly. There we go. Well, um, like the hairdressers, I'm going to have to cut you both short here. Um, <laughs> so, interesting. Right. Plenty of votes have come in. We've got HMRC with 81% of the vote and the taxpayer 19%. Um, Neil, can you um, put us out of our misery? Yes, this was a victory for the underdog. Um, what? The taxpayers the taxpayer. Good heavens. Uh, won the case. <laughs> now, uh, football fans will recall at the weekend, Crystal Palace, bottom of the league, beat Chelsea 2-1 <laughs> in the Premier League. This, I think, was a, a similar result. The Belchers, the Crystal Palace, uh, HMRC, the Premier League leaders. Uh, but the taxpayer won the case. Victory Gracious for me. The taxpayer. Yep. So, um, so the key facts uh, that we can take away. Um, I was amazed when I read this case. I was glad that when I first read it, I was sitting down because I think I'd have fallen over if I hadn't been sitting down. Um, as Rebecca and Emily said, the taxpayers had almost said we are a partnership by doing a partnership tax return. Mm -hmm. They'd almost said we are a partnership and we agree that. It was only when the VAT problem arose, they suddenly U-turned and said, well, actually, no, we're two sole traders. Give us a threshold each and keep us out of the VAT network. Um, and I say they did win. I, I think that what happened was, was the, the judge was persuaded by the fact that, that Mrs. Belcher particularly said, we never were a partnership. We always intend to be autonomous. We wanted to be two sole traders. We didn't consult each other. And I think he took her verbal statements as being a key factor in saying, mm -hmm. yep, they've decided they're sole traders. And that's the key thing. So mm -hmm. interesting issues there. Well, I think never mind Crystal Palace and Chelsea. That one's Leicester City winning the Premier League. It is, absolutely. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. Goodness. And um, just in terms of um, sort of wider, are there wider implications um, of this case, as it were? Yeah, I think that the, the thing with this particular case, if you business split and you set things up properly from day one, mm. i.e. separate bank accounts, separate invoicing, separate suppliers, 
um, if there's any shared expenses and a proper recharge between the two entities, then if HMRC challenged that, that split by issuing a direction under the legislation, they can only do it from a current or a future date. So to a degree you get protection there that if you do the split and they say, yes, you split it, but there's close links here financially, economically, organisationally, then if they do pick it up, they will go from a current date correction by saying this is a partnership, bring them together, that moving forward. What happened to, to the vouchers? Because they'd done these partnership self-assessment tax returns, uh, single bank account, um, single trading name, which was Crew Cuts, they were based in Crew, then HMRC actually went back retrospectively for 10 mm, years. Okay. And that's an important thing. When it comes to late VAT registration, HMRC can go back 20 years maximum, not four years. Four years is correcting errors on previous VAT returns, 20 years for late registration. And they went back to January 2006 in the Belcher's case, and hence this very, very big worrying mm. debt of 125K plus 10K penalty. So. Belchers got away with it, but they had a lot of stress and worry, I'm sure, between the point when HMRC said single business, late registration, to when they won the first tier tribunal case. Mm. And do you think HMRC are going to appeal this one, Neil? I don't think so, no. The, what HMRC tend to say in cases like this is that the case is fact sensitive. It's not about a point of law. No. Um, but what I think we can take away from this is that if I'd have had a client ring me up or an accountant saying, these are the facts, HMRC say it's a partnership, what do you think? I'd have said it's a partnership. Yes. Mm -hmm. So mm. sometimes perhaps we need to challenge a bit more and say, well, actually, yeah, the indications are A, B, C, D. It's a joint single mm. business, but X, Y, Z, we could perhaps argue yep. differently. But planning from day one, far too much in VAT is after the horse has bolted. Planning in advance is the key to often a successful yep. VAT outcome. Mm. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, and you can read more about the um, read more about the case. Um, uh, this case in Neil's Accounting Web article on the um, on the Belcher case uh, on AccountingWeb.co.uk. Um, right on to case two. Okay, this is a, a common one. I remember when I was an inspector back in the eighties in, in customs and excise. It used to be very common for businesses to claim input tax when they bought a new car and they would say, we only use this car for business journeys, therefore we can claim the input tax back. Uh, I would assess that VAT disallow it because the key thing in the leg legislation is the car must be only used for business purposes and not be available for private journeys. So that word availability <coughs> is a crucial part of the equation. So we're gonna look at a case where a company bought six cars and claimed input tax of 27,000 pounds on the cars. Uh, HMRC disallowed and the taxpayer appealed. So let's look at the facts on this particular case. Uh, this is a construction company and the contracts of employment signed by all employees said very clearly, if you use a company car for private journeys, you'll, you will be subject to disciplinary procedures and this must not happen. So there was a contractual um, requirement for employees not to use a car for private journeys. So the cars were either left on site overnight or they were returned to the company's head office and parked on the company premises. So they're never taken home by the employees to their home addresses. Uh, the employees in question, the six employees, all had a separate vehicle they owned privately which they used for their own private journeys. So we're looking here at the issue of availability. Um, were the company correct to claim input tax on the cars on the basis that those cars were not available for private use or were HMRC correct to assess the tax because at the end of the day, all cars have some private use and as a matter of fact, HMRC like to disallow all input tax on cars unless it's a tool of trade like for example, a car hire business, a driving school or a, um, motor dealership. So that's the issues. Mm. Good stuff, right. Um, let's open the polls then. Did HMRC, uh, was it sort of a smooth drive or uh, did HMRC's case stall uh, with this one? Emily, uh, Rebecca? I've got a question for you, Neil. Um, 
If any of those cars were sold during the time, then did the company pay output VAT on the sales? That's a good question. They should have done. Um, I don't recall from reading the report whether that issue came up. But yes, if you claim input tax back on a, a car, yes. the onward sale becomes subject to output tax. Yes. Um, looking at the legislation, when you buy a car and you don't claim input tax, in other words, your input tax blocked, yes. when you sell on that asset or that vehicle, you're actually making an exempt supply. Yes under Schedule 9 Group 14, because if your input tax mm -hmm. blocked, you sell on, it's exempt rather than zero. Uh, but yes, uh, that issue didn't come up, but they should have done. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing at the time of the tribunal, they probably still owned all the six vehicles, so that right. was perhaps not relevant. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in this sort of case, there's been lots and lots of cases on cars like this, hasn't there? I remember a fairly famous one, wasn't it? Fagomatic? Oh yes, the <laughs> <laughs> cigarette man. Yeah, the guy had <laughs> a, uh, something Upton. like a Porsche or Lamborghini. A Lamborghini. He yes. never tried to reclaim that on a Lamborghini. He did. Oh my he did. <laughs> and he used the Lamborghini, or so he said, for transporting cigarettes <laughs> between pubs <laughs> because it was in the days where pubs could sell cigarettes in machines mm -hmm. and he owned these machines that were in various pubs and clubs. <laughs> Um, yes, and it was a huge amount of bat rat on the well, Lamborghini. Well, it would be on a Lamborghini. Um, he lost. I'm not surprised. <laughs> well, well, actually, he, he won the first oh, appeal. Oh, did he? And then he lost the second. Oh, right. He lost at the other tribunal. And what yeah. happens sometimes in tribunals is HMRC in the first tier tribunal, if they think it's a dead cert they're going to win, like in the, the Belgers case, they bring out their reserve team, talking about <laughs> football again, uh, which I think they did in the... In fact, Upton case. So then, yeah. when they lost, they thought, "Hang on, we've got a big problem here." They then appealed mm. to the higher court in that one, and they won in mm. the second court quite rightly mm. because it yeah. was uh, it was quite a ludicrous. Um, so thinking back to that case, I would have thought that this company, you know, it would be very difficult for them to win this. Mm. But I don't know. What do you think? I'm not so sure. I think the fact that they were so strongly not available for private use, that they mm. were contractually not available for private use, and presumably the actual facts of what happened on a day-to-day -day basis didn't contradict the contract, because you see that sometimes, don't mm. you? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So if they did actually adhere to the provisions of the contract, scrupulously so, mm. obviously I don't know whether any of the employees actually did go through disciplinary action for private use of a company car, but if in the real world the contract did actually stand up, then it's possible it was a taxpayer win. Yes. Mm. There we go. Um, we're going to have to pull an emergency stop on the uh, on the voting now. So, um, yeah, currently we have, um, who won the case? HMRC, 30% of people have voted for um, the tax authority and taxpayer is on 70%. Neil, can you reveal the result, please? Well done to the viewers. They're spot on. It was a taxpayer victory, the mm -hmm. case of Zone Contractors Limited, probably about 18 months ago, and a good win for the taxpayer. They could claim the £27,000 of input tax on those six vehicles. So let's look at the key issues on the slide that we can take away. Now, when it comes to input tax and cars, you're looking for, for one of two things, either a physical restriction on private use or a contractual restriction. And what we've got here is a contractual restriction, which the tribunal was happy actually took place in practice on the day-to-day -day workplace. Um, just to mention another case on, on cars a number of years ago, Elm Milk Limited, if make a note of that, Elm Milk, this was a single person company, a one person company mm -hmm. like my own, uh, and there was a board meeting minutes of this one person saying that the car could not be used for private purposes in the board meeting minutes. And amazingly, they, the taxpayer won that particular mm -hmm. case as well on that particular issue, uh, which has stood the test of time. I think a key thing on this particular case was that the individuals um, did have separate vehicles to mm. do their own private travel. And also as well, rightly or wrongly, the tribunal um, dismissed minor private use. Now, in reality, mm. I always used to say when I was on the lecture circuit, it's impossible to, to have a car that does no private use because if you're on the way to Tesco, on, on the way to a client's for business and you detour to Tesco's to get a loaf of bread and a pint of milk, that's a private journey. Um, the, the tribunal here, the, the judge reported, we ignore de minimis, we ignore incidental use, and that was part of his thinking in a, allowing the appeal. Mm, that is interesting.
Yeah, mm. fascinating stuff. And again, um, you can um, read Neil's uh, full article on the zone contracting case on accountingweb.co.uk. Um, I think we'll pop it up in the chat window. I'll pop a link in there for you. Um, right, moving on then. Uh, case three, Neil. Okay, thank you, Tom. Yes, uh, what is a business? Always an important issue. Uh, you can only get VAT registration if you are making taxable supplies, and the key phrase is in the course or furtherance of a business. Now, to give you some history, going back to the 1980s, there was a landmark VAT case involving Lord Fisher. And he owned some land and he organised uh, shoots with a group of friends. He charged the friends for taking part and they had a good day shooting. And the issue arose, was that income from his friends subject to VAT or was it ignored because it was effectively non-business, i.e. a private hobby? Mm -hmm. And the court established six business tests which have stood the test of time about what is or isn't a business. Now, you don't go through and say, well, if the score is 4-2, it's a business or 5-1 or whatever. Uh, you look at the overall picture, having done these business tests and say, yes, this is a business uh, or no, it's a hobby. Quite important this modern age where people do a little bit of ducking and diving on eBay or the internet selling a few goods. Is that a hobby? Is it a business? And um, this next case is relevant regarding a recording studio, uh, input tax costs, and whether HMRC could actually disallow the input tax, there was no business, or whether the taxpayer was correct to make the claim. So let's look at the key facts on the slide. Now the business became VAT registered in 2009, uh, an intention to construct a recording studio and hire it out for fees of about £500 to £700 a day to customers or businesses that want to record music. Um, 2009 is significant, that was soon after the financial crash in 2008. They had trouble finding customers, the building went wrong, I think there's some cash flow challenges and a sad story, they never made any sales at all and HMRC came along in 2014, uh, cancelled the registration, said no, you should never have got a VAT number in the first place, there's no business, disallowed all of the input tax back to May 2009, and uh, not a good result for the taxpayer. Uh, a few facts on this particular case, that there was a main director who owned 35% of the shares, his friend, the company secretary, owned 5% of the shares, and there was an external investor uh, that owned the other 60% of mm -hmm. the shares. So, very straightforward question. Was there a business, and therefore fine to claim input tax, uh, even though they never made any sales, or was it really a hobby, recording studio, the director liked music, and therefore no scope to claim input tax and all these expensive costs of constructing the studio? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so voting is open. Um, I can see it's a 50-50 split at the moment. Um, Rebecca, Emily, what are your thoughts? Well, a business doesn't have to make a profit, does it? No. Um, and this business actually didn't make any sales, so that was not good for the uh, taxpayers. But just because it was a failed business doesn't mean there wasn't a business. No, exactly. And they had this external investor. I mean, mm. he had what percentage? It was a large percentage. 60%. Large percentage, didn't yes. it? The external investor. So he must have believed there was some sort of genuine possibility of making money, mm. or if he wouldn't have put his money in. No, exactly. So I can see where HMRC are coming from. However, you know, looking at it from a sort of, you know, direct tax point of view, mm. I think there was an intention there. Well, I do too, because if it were the case that it was just simply the director's hobby, he liked music, mm. he wanted to have bands coming and playing, um, mm. then surely he would just have fitted up a little studio for himself in his back bedroom or mm. in his garden shed. He wouldn't have gone to all the trouble of hiring commercial buildings, getting mm. them fitted out to that kind of mm. level. Um, the fact that HMRC got involved suggests there was a large sum of money involved here yes. that they'd reclaimed. 
and also your point about the external investor, Rebecca, unless somebody is extraordinary, extraordinarily philanthropic or mm. very, very keen on music, mm. they're not going to put all that money into mm. a recording studio unless they think it's going to make a profit. Yeah. So the external investor must have lost his money yes. through the business, well, I mean, through the failed enterprise. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, but I can see what HMRC were looking at it. There's been mm. no sales. You weren't making an effort to make a sale. So, you know, I can see that they had a strong argument as well. Mm. But equally, Neil's point about the um, year is significant. The fact that it was the recession. Um, mm. I guess that at that time, people weren't thinking about recording music. They were thinking about putting bread on the table. Mm. So... It may have been that no matter how hard the owner of this company or the director of this company mm. tried mm. to make mm. sales, that there just wasn't yeah. the customer the out there. The music business is, is very fickle, isn't it? It's oh, very yes. hard to make money in the music business. Oh, yes, so exactly. It was a huge risk for all involved. It was. I think that's quite important because in the music business, there is a lot of optimism. Yes. A project's going to be the, the, the best thing that's going to have happened and there's yes. optimism, there's expectation. And when it comes to VAT, you you can claim input tax with an intention mm. to make mm. taxable supplies. You don't not. actually have to make them. And one thing that people often think is that there's a time limit between you, when you claim input tax, you must make your first sale within 12 months or 18 months. There's nothing specified in the legislation about when the first sale must happen. No. So, so a lot of interesting factors on this particular mm. case. And um, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah. Not so one side is the other one, the, the hairdressing case, and mm. uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, there'll be an even split of your votes on this, Tom. You'd have thought so, but um, yeah, in this recording studio case, uh, it looks like the um, the voters are singing from the same hymn sheet here. So 78% um, have said that the taxpayer came out victorious, whereas just 23% have, um, have voted for HMRC. So... Um, Neil, can you um, reveal yeah. the winner of the X Factor? <laughs> well done to the viewers again. Um, oh. A taxpayer victory on this one. Uh, the case of Gravel Road Records Limited and uh, case reference 5598. And um, yeah, I think the, the points that Rebecca and Emily made were really the key ones that went in favour of the taxpayer, the external investor. Mm. Uh, it wasn't anybody from Dragon's Den. <laughs> Uh, but it was a, a proper investment company mm. that was c looking to make a return on uh, capital. When I sort of read this particular case, I came away thinking this recording studio, um, it's a bit like that scene in Faulty Towers where the guest says to Sybil, uh, is my fresh fruit salad ready yet? And uh, Sybil says, oh, yes, we've just opened the tin. <laughs> uh, I think this recording studio was intended to be the the top-notch recording studio that they mm. could hire out for £700 a day and they would have all the great stuff. And now I think they got restricted with costs and the building weren't went, went wrong and, and the things weren't done to the level that they perhaps hoped. Two key customers walked away from doing any bookings. They were reliant on two key customers mm. booking the studio a lot. The financial crash 2009, optimism by the, the music industry and... Um, Hence, there was that genuine intention mm. to make taxable supplies. Uh, a couple of key important points here. There's no problem at all claiming input tax on abortive costs. So if you set up the intention of a business uh, and it goes wrong and you never trade, if there was a genuine intention, you're fine to claim input tax. So just because HMRC never had any output tax, it doesn't mean the taxpayers blocked from claiming input mm. tax, which sometimes people think. And there is no time period between when you incur input tax and you account for output tax. There's been a case recently, um, a charity case, where they're building um, or growing trees and they probably won't mm, sell the wood nice. for mm. probably 150 years. Yes, so exactly. you've got input tax on all the costs of the, the growing the trees with a very long wait to output tax. And again, it all comes down to that basic principle um, is there a business? Now, the reason I asked um, or suggested we include this one in today's session is because one thing HMRC do, um, despite their limited resources, is when a business gets a VAT number for the first time, newly registered, then often that first VAT return goes in, it's a repayment, 
and HMRC usually verify repayment VAT returns. And they do this in a number of ways. They look for the major purchase invoices to support the input tax claim, and they often cross-reference back to the supplier to check they've accounted for output tax. Um, they also ask the question, is there a business here? Um, and they ask for things like business plans or proof of orders or correspondence to support there is a fact uh, of business taking place. So that's why I was surprised this one went to tribunal because if they could prove they had the orders from these two customers that then said, oh no, we don't want this studio, it's not the, the fresh fruit salad, it's the, the tin of peaches, uh, that would have been in evidence of an intention to trade, uh, the external investor. So it's one that I was surprised HMRC mm. took to tribunal and as our voting shows, mm. Um, mm. the viewers agree. So, interesting. And interestingly as well, Neil, you make the point that there's um, six criteria that the VAT side of HMRC, if you like, used to say, is somebody in business. But that's as distinct from the nine badges of trade for income tax. So again, we've got, as we were talking about this morning, Rebecca, yes. you've got sort of different rules for different taxes. And I guess that might have partly been what saved the Belchers in the first case we discussed, that they could um, present partnership income tax returns, but for VAT, they counted as two businesses. Yes, that's right. Different the rules taxes, are very different, different rules. What I find sometimes in HMRC, a lot of HMRC VAT staff are now ex what we call ex revenue staff mm. so they've moved across from direct tax into proper tax <laughs> and uh, i'll get that one in <laughs> and sometimes you get a, a vat inquiry from an officer that, that asking income tax based questions mm. um like money like with vat it's not about where the money goes to and from it's about the supplies of goods and services and where they mm. go to so as an example if um someone in the UK orders a computer for her nephew's birthday and the nephew lives in America, then the fact that the customer is in the UK and the UK customer pays the money, the goods go to America, mm -hmm. that's an export. So yes. yeah, I, I agree there's, there's these two different rules mm. on VAT and um, direct tax, which can, um, I was think, thinking as well, um, I don't know what happened to this company and it just it seemed to have just closed down but there had been a, a lot of losses there yes. in the company. Yes, which, yes. Um, that was the point you made that the yeah. external investor lost yeah. his money and presumably yeah. the director would have lost some of his as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, mm. so uh, yeah, Good interesting stuff. case. And mm. uh, yeah, uh, we can read about it again in Neil's Accounting Web article um, which we'll pop a link in the chat window for. We've had a couple of questions uh, okay. come in on this as well. Um, Brian23 has asked, are there any specific examples of other applications for this decision that slash case? Mm. Uh, as in... Have any, other fu have any future cases drawn on the principle established in this one? No, not as far as I know. This one's quite a recent one. Mm -hmm. um, again, when it comes to quoting cases in future tribunals, um, HMRC always say, well, that's, that's fact sensitive. And first tier tribunal cases are only binding on the taxpayer and HMRC. Mm. So it's unlike the ones in upper tribunal or beyond where there's more um, HMRC have to reflect the decisions. Um, but no, what I think this case is useful for is to highlight if there are any challenges by HMRC on what's a business or what's not a business, is to bring out those key factors and say, well, right, in the Grove case, we've got external investors. Uh, we've got customers who were lined up but then withdrew. We've got financial pressures on the cash flow. The building went wrong. All these factors, you build in a clear package that this was not um, a guy, as you mentioned, um, opening a recording studio in his back bedroom. It was actually a genuine commercial mm. motive. There was a VAT case recently, which I can't remember the name of, uh, a lady who set up a business doing consultancy services and she put her first VAT return in claiming input tax on purchases of wine. Mm. Um, nice which try. is a totally <laughs> different activity to what she declared. And she always said that the sideline is, I'm going to um, trade in wine. But her main business activity in the uh, VAT registration form was consultancy. So needless to say, she lost the case mm. and HMRC disallowed. I half expected you to say that she said it was wine to entertain her future mm. clients. <laughs> Possibly that's what mm. she would have said if she, before yes. she realised that that would be input tax blocked under exactly, business entertaining. Exactly, business entertaining, so yes. Interesting thought. Mm. Excellent. Um, so, so there's another question there. 
Um, there's one question um, from Rangeeth, um, who I think was in touch this morning, actually. Um, would you be able to discuss the limited cost trader since it is not clear to any of us? Oh. That is a very different topic to what we're talking mm. about. This is to do with the flat rate scheme. And the 1st of April 2017, a new rate came in of 16.5%, which means basically very little input tax credit. You're almost paying all your VAT on your sales with, mm. with minimal input tax credit. Uh, for businesses that um, buy less than 2% of their gross sales yeah. mm. as goods, or less than £250 in a quarter. Now, without going into all the detail, the, the key thing is that there's lots of exclusions on relevant goods, like, yes. for example, food and drink, uh, goods for a sideline activity, uh, road fuel, unless you're a taxi driver, there's all yeah. these exclusions. Car parts as well, isn't yes. it? And car Motor parts, expenses. that's yeah. right, all kinds. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, what I've found in, in practice since the 1st of April is I very rarely get questions now from accountants about the flat rate scheme. Unfortunately, the flat rate scheme was mainly a winner with tax savings for service businesses with little input tax. So standard rated income, uh, very little input tax, adopt a 12 or a 14% rate and make mm. some good money. Uh, what I think is happening is a lot of businesses that were voluntarily registered uh, and using the flat rate scheme have deregistered because those savings have gone. Um, and I think a lot of accountants and advisors are now ignoring the flat rate scheme completely on the basis that this is a complicated category, this limited cost trader. Mm. The end result is you have to check it every quarter. Um, if you fall into it, then you're not going to, you're probably going to pay more tax using the scheme than if you don't. Uh, and in reality, it's probably best now to say the flat rate scheme was good while it lasted. Mm. And now we've, we'll revert back to mm. normal accounting. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's been lots of articles that you've done on Accounting Web on the flat rate scheme, isn't there? Yes. You know, we, yes. we could put some of those in the uh, notes to be released later, we, I think, because we, we have a whole will. selection of them. We yeah. certainly will, yes. and the uh, supporting document we'll send out. And we'll also mention that case that you, um, that you mentioned earlier. We'll find the name for that and yes. uh, pop it up. So, case four, the final case, uh, one that I think is probably dear to your heart, Neil. Yes, my number two sport, cricket. I won't say what the number one is, but uh, <laughs> living in Manchester, you can probably uh, guess what it is. Uh, I, I suggested this particular uh, case because certainly um, charity officials and also many advisors think that once you get a charity involved with things, then VAT becomes a red herring is completely ignored. Oh, we're a charity, we don't pay VAT on our building repairs or our accountancy fees, whatever. Um, that is not the case. Uh, charities get VAT concessions in the legislation. They don't get special treatment. And when they do get these concessions, they need to overcome a number of obstacles before they get the desired result, which is normally they get zero rating when they buy in um, goods or services. And this case we're going to look at now involves a cricket club in Oxfordshire, so um, quite an affluent part of the country. And they had a new cricket pavilion built and they were trying to get zero rating on the construction services uh, linked to the cricket pavilion. So let's look at the, the key, flat, key facts. The key thing is, um, is the cricket club a charity? So the new pavilion was constructed for members and the local community. And this is a key issue that the, the taxpayer put forward. It's not just for the cricket club members, the 75 playing members, it's the whole of the village that benefits from this particular building. Uh, so social and um, community use, as well as a cricket uh, facility, which, which makes sense because cricket is only played at the weekends and what, four or five months a year, uh, which leaves the building empty for many months uh, and many days. Now, the Cricket Club was a Community Amateur Sports Club, CASC, which means it gets certain um, privileges, like, for example, 80% off its um, domestic rates bill. It was not a charity with the Charities Commission, um, but it claimed it was a charity based on its constitution and its objectives of promoting sport and community involvement. Uh, the Cricket Pavilion also included a bar area and a lounge for social purposes, as well as the cricket changing rooms and the, uh, the parts of the building to store all the, the cricket equipment. 
Uh, legislation says that if you've got a building used by a charity for charitable purposes, like for example a church, um, or a village hall or similar, i.e. community use mm -hmm. building, then um, the charity can issue a certificate to the builder and the builder can then zero rate his um, supply of materials and goods for that particular project. Materials only will be standard rated, so we're looking at services and materials supplied as part of the service. Uh, the Cricket Club issued that certificate, uh, therefore claim zero rating. Uh, HMRC said no, that this is a standard rated project, we want output tax. Uh, the reason, of course, this is so important is because the Cricket Club could not claim input tax, so a 20% VAT charge is a massive issue. So key thing there is uh, did HMRC win, i.e. standard rated building services, or the taxpayer win with um, zero rating? Yeah. Well, it sounds like a community building, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like it was almost a pseudo village hall. Mm. Um, so on that basis, you know, maybe they should have won. Or however, there's some sort of doubt about whether they were a charity or not. Because you say they weren't registered no. with the Charity, with the charity commission. commission. Exactly, I yes. There's quite a lot of confusion mm. about these special community action uh, sports mm. clubs. Yes. Mm. As they get some sort of charity rules, but not all of them. Mm. So... Mm. Is this one that they do or one that they don't? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, actually, whether the whole sort of um, bar area aspect might have put the kibosh on it, because I'm thinking of a club I belong to in London that's a members club, and that enjoys special rates because it doesn't have a bar um, and doesn't have a restaurant. It serves breakfast but no other meals. and. Just when you said that, Neil, it just rang a bell in my brain and made me think, well, I wonder if that's because it's not obliged to charge. Um, um, there was a VAT element in there. So I wonder if that's new, could it? I wonder possibly if, mm. because it wasn't a real charity, so to speak, because it wasn't registered with the Charity Commission. But equally, mm. it's a community service building, as you said, yeah. Rebecca, if it's used by the whole community, if it's sort of mm. a village hall type area, because as you said, Neil, in the legislation, it says a village hall or similar. Where do you draw the line? What yes. is similar to a village hall? So yes. I can see how I mean, it could I have gone if either way. If the village already had a village hall. That's true. Why would know, it need another one? They might have looked at that and said, oh, the village already has a village hall. It doesn't yeah. need another cricket village hall as well. Exactly. And if they built a bar in it, they might think, well, this is a pseudo pub, really. Exactly. Pseudo pub, not pseudo village hall. Yeah. Um, I suppose, yes, if the village had a village hall, mm. possibly even if the village hall weren't the only one, because you mm. do get halls mm. attached to churches That's as well. Right. Yes. So if the community already had access to those kinds of spaces why then would they need mm -hmm. another one in the cricket pavilion goodness yep yeah. um, voting is open I'll give you a couple more seconds to uh, to dial in yeah um, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that googly has been a lot of cases over the years about what is a village hall has yes. there now that's and, interesting and, and and as an extreme example if it's like a swimming pool <laughs> then that is not a village hall because well, it's limited no, it's to one pool. area yeah. of people so it's got to be a wide yes. level like theater groups can go in and charities Scout tiny and guides, scouts group, and I whatever imagine. yes um i suppose um, the phrase village hall does go back in time doesn't it mm. because vat mm. came in in what 1973 and yes. mm. in those days there was whist drives at village halls and yes bingo every week at yes. village halls and then the local football team used to change the village hall because it didn't have its own changing rooms because there yeah. was not mm. the facilities around so um the thing about what is a charity has kept the courts busy and what is a village hall has kept mm. the, the courts busy and um yes fantastic well um come on then umpire <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. um let's hope this hasn't stumped too many of you um <laughs> we'll close the voting and it looks as if 70% of the voters have said that HMRC won the case and 30% have said the taxpayer won the case. Neil? Very good. And again, the viewers have got this spot on. Uh, Eansham Cricket Club in Oxfordshire, a win for HMRC, case reference 6047. So let's look at the key factors in this particular case on the slide here. Um, yeah, a CASC is very different to a charity and 
yes, it's a, an indicator of charitable activities and good causes, but it's not a key issue. Um, the judge was very complimentary about the taxpayer mm -hmm. in this case because they really present a real good package of information about why the cricket club should be classed as a charity, even though it's not registered with the Charities Commission. Mm -hmm. um, so they they put they give a, a real good shot, and if they'd have won the case, it could have opened the doors for a lot of similar claims. And HMRC would almost certainly have probably appealed this one because it's looking at a point mm -hmm. of principle. Um, so once you, you've not got charitable status, then that has basically ended your argument of potential zero rating because that's the first hurdle you need to overcome. Uh, what the judge then did, he said, well, OK, if it was a charity, the cricket club, which it wasn't, was it a charitable building? The answer he said was no. Now, a charitable building is like a church, place of worship, uh, a building which homeless people get food and drink and treatment, so it's a non-business part of the building. He said that the bar would have uh, kiboshed that mm. argument that it was a charitable mm. building. It wasn't. Uh, but he did accept that the community use would have classed it as a village hall or similar. So if the charity status had been ticked as a yes, they'd have won the case because of the village hall side of thing, because it's a village hall or charitable building. Really? Um, Even though they had the bar area, that wouldn't yes, have stopped it? Mm. Yes, mm. that's right. So that's an interesting one. Um, if you've got a, a charitable building like a church, um, you can have a business activity in there of up to 5% of the building. So if um, you've got, for example, a cathedral with a, um, with a small bookshop area, yes. a small cafe, and the, obviously the cathedral would be um, charitable, then as long as it's 5% or less on the business, then you can still treat the whole of the services as um, zero rating. I do get accountants say to me, we've got a client who's, who's got a building going up, a charity client, where 50% will be business like a cafe, 50% will be charitable like a place of worship. Is it correct that the builder charges that on 50% of his services? Um, answer no, it's got to be 100% apart from the 5%, otherwise it's fat on the whole lot. So again, mm. that... Unless, of course, the builder did two different contracts for the different part of the building. So would it then work to get different builders mm. yes. to work different on the different... Builders <laughs> yes. Building the cafe mm. and building the place of worship. It may sound ludicrous, but would that work? I so you get you um, so you John get and son builder John senior builder. <laughs> 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 um, you're thinking well, but it, the reason it wouldn't work is because that's actually that's stage three. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so what Rebecca's saying is you get one builder builds the cafe that would be plus VAT, and then one builder builds the rest of the building, which is wholly charitable. But where that would fail because and where this is another interesting fact about this case. This case was taken to tribunal by the customer, not the builder. Mm -hmm. The yeah. customer said we want zero rating, so they took mm. to tribunal. Um, the third stage is that the customer then certifies to builders, uh, mm. so builders for the mm. CAF and builder for the other mm. part, mm. that this building will be wholly used for oh, a charitable right. purpose or village hall, um, apart from the 5%. So uh, he, even though one builder is working on the whole of the charity bit, say, which mm. might be 85%, and the CAF might be 15% in the bookshop, um, he, the, the client, the, the charity, couldn't issue the certificate to either of those oh. builders because the, the overall building mm. is... Uh, but yeah, that's an interesting one about uh, splitting the... Unless yeah. they're se literally separate freestanding buildings because then the whole of that building would be. Yes, yes. that will be a different issue. And one thing as well about uh, charity buildings, and there, there was a... I had a, a long chat with an accountant about this recently, is if you've got an existing, let's say, an existing charity building, and you build one very close to it mm. um, as a new building standalone. If it's an annex that's being constructed yes. from bare land, mm. then you've got scope for zero rating as long as it meets the conditions of an annex, like its own separate entrance and its own separate function from the main building, its own mm. power supply. Um, an extension to an existing building is always standard rated. So you've got a charity building with an extension, the extension is standard rated. A charity building with a new annex for a charitable purpose, then the annex, if it meets the conditions in VAT Notice 708, then you can potentially get zero rating. I sat with an architect in o Oxford about um, oh, six, seven years ago, uh, looking at plans and trying to see mm. whether it was an extension or an annex to do with a, a oh, church. Wow. And um, in the end, we 
got it as an annex and it saved mm. a lot of VAT. Yeah. Mm, Good stuff. Um, fascinating. And, and um, as you probably will, uh, well, you won't be surprised to know, you can read Neil's article on the Cricket Club on accountingweb.co.uk. We'll pop a link in the chat box now. Um, just opening up finally for a couple of general questions. Uh, Paul D asks, um, I'd be really interested to know if sole practitioners like me really advise at this level of detail. There seems so much to know when it comes to VAT. Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, yes, I, I think um, the best advice to sole practitioners, if you're unsure, ask an expert. Yes. Um, there are quite a lot of expert networks out there for mm -hmm. tax advisors to do, uh, you know, become part of one of those networks or, you know, you can pay to get uh, uh, expert tax advice from various helplines as well. Never wing it with VAT. Never, never wing it because the amounts can be huge and the cost will be yes. expensive. Mm. Um, so if in doubt, ask advice. Yep, I would echo that. I've got a phrase that I sometimes use in my writing work is the shark infested waters <laughs> mm -hmm. of the nation's favourite tax, uh, which goes back to I think when I first started in the 1880s, in the, the Jaws films were quite... Mm. Um, yes. Uh, but what I would say is I think there's three topics in the world of VAT which advisors should always be very, very careful about before they proceed with a, mm -hmm. an advice. For th one, because the rules are complicated, and one, because often the amounts are a lot as um, that we're talking about. And those three topics are land and property. Mm -hmm. yep. And what makes land and property unique is you've got the option to tax rules in yes. place where yes. the taxpayer's got his choice. Do we charge VAT or otherwise? Um, and the thing with the option to tax, which means you should never be complacent about it, um, is that once you've done it, it's with you for 20 years. It's a little, mm. little bit like marriage, easy to get into it, but quite hard to get out of it. So once you've done it, it's 20 years before you can mm. reverse it. Secondly, uh, partial exemption uh, with the input tax restrictions on mm. taxable exempts and the calculations go with it. Uh, a lot of responsibility on accountants and advisors when they have got a partly exempt business like a, a sports club or um, financial services business mm. or dispensing state agents, doctor whatever. is one that doctors is, is, absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. Dispen uh, dispensing doctor if yes. they've got the pharmacy and yeah. the surgery mm. yeah uh, and a lot of accountants say right we're going to play safe and claim the lower of the two options. So if we think it's a mixed cost, we'll treat it as exempt. We think it's tax, we'll treat it as a residual or mixed. Playing safe is good, but equally that can cost you, your clients lots of money. Yeah. Uh, and the third topic is international. Yes. And the reason that is, is a, a minefield is because you have the exceptions. Yes. Like you mm -hmm. might say to a client, oh yeah, if you invoice an overseas business for your services, then you don't charge that. That's, that's great. And that applies in 95% of cases. But if you've got a land service, like you're an architect and you're providing mm. services to a, a Russian businessman, uh, but the land is in the UK, then that's a UK mm. bat supply. So it's the exceptions that can cause the fun and game. Yes. So they're the three it's topics that probably advice and mm. support is needed. Yep. All right, fascinating stuff. One final question then. Um, the user has... Uh, yeah, I'm amusingly named a cruel world here. Um, are there any VAT issues we should keep an eye on for upcoming end of year? For the budget and what have you? Um, it just says upcoming end of financial year. Right. End of the financial year. Mm. Um, I can't think of anything particularly, can you, Neil? That I think that one thing to think about, which is partly to do with MTD, part of the flat rate scheme, is whether there is potential now for a lot of businesses to, to consider deregistration yes. Yes. if they're voluntarily registered. Um, one of the things that people often misunderstand about deregistration, it's not about historical sales, it's mm. about the sales in the next 12 months. So if you've got a husband and wife partnership doing 60,000 of fees each, mm. uh, 120,000 a year, and the wife decides to retire or the husband retires, so moving mm. forward, they'll be doing 60 or 70,000 a year. It's all about sales in the next 12 months. Mm. Um, so I think that there's, it's worth thinking about whether there might be scope for more deregistration um, on that basis. So either clients who are voluntarily registered, perhaps because they win with the flat rate scheme, mm. which they no longer do because of this limited mm. cost trader thing, um, 
Also as well, that keeps you a bit distant from MTD mm. coming in in April 19, where there's a link between mm. VAT and online. So I think possibly... Um, also with the MTD, some, uh, a fact I came across yesterday actually preparing for that session was that once you're within MTD for VAT, you're in. If your turnover drops, so you no longer have to be VAT registered, you're still in. Exactly. It's you're a lobster in, pot. You're in until you deregister for well, VAT. Yes, but I think yes. you're in forever, actually. But if, it, if yeah. when MTD is only for VAT, I think presumably if you no longer have VAT to report because you're deregistered, yes. you couldn't be in it anymore. Yeah. But I think that's a very fair point. The other point, Neil, you made the point about international VAT. Are we expecting to see changes in VAT because of Brexit in our dealings with the EU, which we are no longer going to be part of? Will the rules change for, for example, being able to zero rate supplies of goods um, going yeah. to the wider yeah, EU? Yeah, that's right. Obviously, Brexit is still this sort of je ne sais quoi that no one's quite sure. But what I am suggesting to accountants is that if clients involved in selling goods just to think about their supply chains. Now, one example of, of something that could cause a lot of issues is uh, in the VAT, where we've got something called triangulation. Of course, triangulation, uh, Which yes. I call strangulation, because it can <laughs> be quite tricky. We've got, let's give the example, you've got a Polish manufacturer, a UK middle person, and a German customer. Mm -hmm. All three businesses, they're in different EU countries. The goods go straight from Poland to Germany, which is logical geographically, it avoids all the sea. At the moment, as long as you've got a UK VAT number, Polish VAT number, German VAT number, Poland invoices UK VAT free, UK invoices Germany VAT free, Germany accounts for VAT on its VAT mm -hmm. return, nice and easy. If you take the UK out of the EU, yes. then suddenly you've, you've not got triangulation. No. And uh, looking at that logically, that means a, a, the UK business is, is effectively receiving and selling goods in Germany and will need a German VAT number. So. They're the things to think about, the, the issues with the supply chain and uh, there's been quite a lot of profile about importing from, if you buy goods from France after what, 19 or if it comes in, then that becomes an import, so you've got to pay 20% VAT, which is a cash flow issue before you get it back on a, a VAT return as input mm. tax, that sort of thing. Um, making directive claims at the moment online to get that back paid in mm. overseas countries in the EU, uh, that won't be a online EU scheme, that'll be a, mm. a 13th directive claim which involves a paper form to mm. Northern Ireland with invoices mm. and a different set of rules, which again, we might be blocked from doing if we've not got reciprocal agreements with the other yes. EU countries. So supply chains and just being aware of the problems without the solutions mm. being clear is probably mm. a, a good strategy. Wonderful, well, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. We could probably talk for hours more about this, but uh, our hour is up. So Neil Warren, thank you so much for joining us. And Emily Coltman, Rebecca thank you, Cave, thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you also for watching. Um, if you like the session, do drop us some feedback in the chat box. Um, our marketing department will like that. Um, but uh, yeah, we will send out an on-demand version in the next couple of days. You will get the slides and a follow-up document with all the information you have mentioned. Um, use the links on the slides to get to Neil's articles. And uh, for more information on VAT and the big wide world of accountancy, do visit accountingweb.co.uk. Thank you very much to Free Agent for supporting this session. That's all we've got time for. Thank you very much for watching. Bye bye.